Hey, it's Kevin from Automatic CSS. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're gonna work on a real landing page. This is a project that we got from frontendmentor.com. Basically, it's a website that gives you projects just to help you practice and get better. I like to use them as examples for tutorials because they give you all of the stuff that it, you would typically have in a real project. And what I want is for you to see more examples of automatic CSS and frames being used in real world environments. And so this is part of our ongoing effort to provide as much education as possible, not just around our tools, but around web design and development in general. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We're gonna take a look at exactly what we are going to build today. It's a fairly simple landing page. And, um, but it does present some unique challenges, right? It has an overlay header, for example. Uh, it has a button that needs to hover into an outline button. It's got some of these design accents. It's got shape dividers. Uh, we're gonna be talking about how to set up the colors properly in automatic CSS. It's got an overlapping, uh, two overlapping elements right here. So, you know, it's, very short, it's very basic, but it also presents some really good things for us to tackle and to chew on. And what I'm gonna do is go slow. I'm gonna walk through it, I'm gonna talk through it, I'm gonna go over all of the details so that you're not just watching me build a page, you're actually understanding the thought process that goes into things, the best practices to use for automatic CSS and frames. You're gonna get, hopefully, a lot out of this video. Um, Frontend Mentor also provides this little design system overview, which is really good. So it's gonna allow us to set up the colors and set up the typography. You're gonna kind of see how this goes from start to finish, set up our buttons and our link styles. This is gonna be really, really, really good. Okay, so I am starting from more or less from scratch here. I do have a blueprint and I'm gonna use that blueprint to spin up a brand new site for us to work on. So I'm gonna go ahead and clone this website and we're gonna call this this work it um, project like that. And then I'm gonna hit clone site. It's gonna go ahead and build that in the background. And while it's doing that, I'm just gonna talk kind of about the, the general setup process of automatic CSS and how I approach new projects. The first thing that we're gonna tackle is setting up the colors. That happens in automatic CSS. We're gonna talk about exactly how to do that. It wants my password here. Uh, then we're gonna set up the fonts, which does not happen in automatic CSS. Um, and then, so I'll walk you through that. Then we are going to set up the website width, and then we're pretty much gonna get started building, right? I, you don't have to get everything prepped and perfect before you start with automatic CSS. That's the beauty of it. And then, because we're gonna be using frames today, we actually get to, you know, do a lot less work. We're gonna, we're gonna see exactly how frames can help us get to the final destination faster and easier. Okay, so let's go over and see if our, looks like it is, our project is ready to go. So I'm gonna click on WP Admin. First thing I'm gonna do is hop over to Automatic CSS and I'm gonna go into the palette area. You're gonna notice that I have a bunch of colors that are predefined here, ready to go. And this is where a lot of the questions start to come in is like, where do I assign these colors? Like which name fits which color? We're gonna walk through that right now. So if we look at our design, what I always say for our base color, this is typically the color that I work on setting first. The base color is the dark color that is used for various backgrounds of the website or for the entire website. Now, this particular theme is what I would call a light theme. It has a white default background, and then in some areas it uses this dark blue color. It also uses the dark blue color right here as well. So I'm identifying this dark blue color as the website's base color. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab that hex code and I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna go down to base and I'm gonna toss this in as our base color. I can go ahead and hit save changes. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hop back over and we're gonna take a look at this green color. Now this green color is used on buttons, it's used as the underline for links. Basically it's used on action items. And this is the next color that's very easy to identify. Anything that is used for the action color is gonna get defined as the action color in automatic CSS. So I'm gonna grab the hex code from right here. I'm gonna hop back over and I'm gonna put this into the action area. 
Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to analyze the third color that they've given us. And, you know, this is where a lot of people feel like, okay, I got to take this and plug it into another slot. What's is this going to be primary? Is this going to be secondary? Is this going to be an accent color? Well, first thing I'm going to do is just look and see where the color is being used in the first place. And honestly, it's not even that obvious. It's used in these social icons right here. It's it. I guess it would be called an accent color because of the way that it's being used. But actually, what I want you to do, we got to pause for a minute and just think about this. Just think about how colors work for a minute. In automatic CSS, every color that I plug in, it's going to automatically generate a bunch of really handy shades for me. Okay, we have ultra dark shades, ultra light shades, and kind of some, some choices in between. We have plenty of options to choose from. What I need to know is, is this color actually part of this color right here? And the way we identify this is by looking at the hue of the color. The hue of this color is 273. The hue of this color is 271. That's a two degree change in the hue. That is very, very imperceptible. That is hard to see with the naked eye. What you're really seeing a difference in is the saturation of this color and the lightness of this color. But more or less, it's this color that's desaturated and it, it, the lightness is increased just a little bit. So we don't wanna program this into a whole new color family. We wanna say, no, this is part of the base. It's just a shade of the base. So we don't even need a new color for this. The next thing we're gonna look at is this light color right here, kind of like an ice white almost. And again, I'm gonna analyze the hue. This is only three degrees off of the hue for the base. And so it just has, it's very saturated and it's very, very, very light, obviously. So this is just yet another shade. I would say that this is base ultra light. It's the ultra light version of the base color. And this is the medium, base medium, okay? And so I know that I can adjust the shades in automatic CSS to fit exactly how I need. I don't need multiple colors for this. And then white, White and black by default are already provided to you in automatic CSS, so I don't need to program that in either. Guys, this site is two colors. It is two colors, okay? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go over, I've set my action, I've set my base, I'm gonna turn off primary, turn off secondary, turn off accent, and hit save. We do not need any other colors for this website build. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need to check on the website width. What is the actual width of the content of this website? Normally, you wanna check the header area up here, or you wanna check one of these grids like this, because you can see that there's a gutter on the left and the right. This is the content width of the website. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna see, let me zoom in on this for you. This is 1114. Now, the one thing I wanna do is check and see if this designer was consistent. I'm gonna click on this grid down here and guys, look at that, 11, 12, it is not the same. I'm gonna go up here, uh-oh, these things aren't even in a, a container properly. This designer has not done a very good job. And as you see, I can't even see the width, but if I hover right here, I see that it's 1109.65. So. These dimensions are, they're very similar, but they're all over the place. There's no real consistency here. Things are not grouped properly. And unfortunately, you're gonna get files like this from designers all the time. And as a developer, you just have to understand, look, we're not copying this nonsense, okay? What we're doing is we're standardizing everything. We're making everything super consistent. And so what we have to do is choose a website width that is going to work and, and relatively match uh, what's going on here. Pixel perfection in 2023 is not a thing. Don't even try to achieve it. Don't even care about it. It's impossible across different device resolutions, much less different device sizes. So what we're trying to achieve is the same balance and rhythm and flow and uh, you know layout and all of that. That's really what we're trying to achieve. The essence of the design, if you will. Okay, so I'm gonna choose 1168 because 1168 is a very standard size on the web and it you know, more or less matches what we've got going on here. So I'm gonna go to my viewport and I'm gonna change my website width to 1168. I'm gonna change my XL breakpoint to 1168. I'm gonna hit save and I need to do the same exact thing inside of Bricks. So I'm gonna edit the homepage with Bricks. 
Go up to settings because automatic CSS and bricks both need to be on the same page as to what the width of this website is. So I'm gonna go to container and I'm gonna set 1168 as the width of this container. All right, the next thing I'm gonna do is set up my fonts because fonts, when I'm, you know, before I can set text sizes and, and heading sizes and all of that, I really need to actually see the font that we are going to be working with on the page. So I'm gonna go up to bricks and I'm gonna go to custom fonts and I'm gonna add new. You see that we have two different fonts that we are working with. Uh, one is called Front Sace. All right, so I'm gonna say Francais, we're gonna edit this, I'm gonna upload the TTF. And these are actually variable fonts that they gave us. So I'm, I'm curious to see exactly how that's gonna work. Uh, we're gonna go, I don't normally work with variable fonts, but we'll find out. The next one is called Man Rope. And I'm gonna open that and I'm gonna upload the TTF of Man Rope. They usually get you uh, WAF files or WAF2 files. This is, you know, they gave us a shoddy Figma file. They're giving us some shoddy font files here too. They're giving us the TTFs. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and publish that and we should be good to go more or less. I'm gonna refresh the builder and I'm gonna go to settings, theme styles, typography, uh, all headings. And for headings, I want to use Francais. And then for body, I want to use, that's where I'm gonna use man rope here, okay? So man rope, and then I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. Let's start getting stuff on the actual page. And this is where frames is gonna come in and really help us hopefully, okay? So the thing that you need to know about working with frames, especially if you've been handed a design, you didn't use frames to do the wireframe for the design, so you, you're just given something and we've got to figure out kind of what matches it. And in order to do this, you want to be thinking in patterns. You don't want to be looking for the exact match. You want to be looking for something that's roughly close. So I'm looking at a pattern and there's common patterns that you're going to see over and over and over and over again. Like for heroes, we have a centered heading, a call to action, and a centered media element. This could be a video, it could be a GIF, it could be an image, it could, I don't care what it is. It's just media. So centered heading, button, and media. That's what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna hop over here and I'm gonna go into the library. I'm gonna go into remote templates. That's where all of my frames are. And let's go ahead and hit refresh. And now you see that we've got all the new version of our frames. Okay, so I need a hero section. I'm gonna go down to hero and I'm gonna stoke, I'm just gonna go to the bottom because I know that all the basic heroes were you know done originally. So again, I'm looking for centered content. This one doesn't happen to have a media file though. Uh, but this one does. Hero Golf has the centered heading, has the media file. I'm going to go ahead and insert Hero Golf. And look, it's already adopting my fonts, right, that I just set on the website. So all of this is absolutely fantastic. Um, let's go ahead and drop in the image here. There's all the images that we're going to need for this build. I'm going to drop them in, and there's the image right there. I'm going to go ahead and hit insert. Perfect. I mean, we're, 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 we're ready to go. But notice, you know, is this actually perfect? Let me go to Figma. Well, we don't have a button. Okay, let's just say that right off the bat. We don't have a button. Uh, and then we have some things we don't need. Like we have an accent heading and we have a paragraph that we don't need. I mean, guys, what should we do here? Should we throw in the towel? And should we be like, oh, frames doesn't match what I'm trying to do? No, you, we know when we built frames that you are smart enough, intelligent enough to make some simple adjustments. You know what? You can go delete, you can go delete, you can go add a heading, okay? And so we got you the majority of the structure. Now we're here, now we're done. So now all I have to do is I have to add a button action class and it's gonna give me an action button. So now I have a hero that's centered, uh, a heading that's centered, an action button and a media element. The next thing that I need to do is get us a that base background color. Well, that is very easy to do with BG base, just like that. Or I can go to the class Hero Golf and I can change the background color of Hero Golf. Now, what should I do? This is a big, big, big common question. It's a very simple answer. If all of your heroes are gonna be that base color, okay? So imagine more pages on the website. Are they all gonna follow the same kind of format where all of your heroes have that base color? If that's the, if that's the case, then grab the class and style the class. So I'm gonna go to background, right click to get my context panel. Um, so this helps me work a little bit faster, add my base color to the section. I, th I can then go to typography, give a right click, go down and select white, grab my heading, grab my class, right click, select white here, and now 
refresh. Let's look at the front end. There we go. So I've got my centered heading. I've got my button. Now you're gonna notice something else. Our button text on the design is base color. Our button text in ACSS and frames is white. What are we gonna do? Throw in the towel or oh, we gotta quit. We gotta quit, it doesn't match. No, we're given out of the box things to work with. Now we need to go make our customizations and arrive at the final destination, right? But look at the amount of work that we're not having to do. I didn't have to build that hero section. Now I'm gonna look down here and we're gonna look at this, which is a process section. I see it's a process because it says one, two, and three. And we actually have process sections in frames. Uh, let's see if we can find something that will work for this. So I'm gonna go back into the builder. And right now I'm just working on structure. We're not really doing all the design elements right now, just trying to get the structure down. Okay, so I'm gonna go into remote templates and now I'm gonna look for process. I'm gonna just type in the word process and I see right here, process grid Bravo. I'm gonna show you why, and I'm actually gonna use the entire section, process section Bravo. I'm gonna show you exactly why, uh, and Bricks likes to do this sometimes, it just throws in the, the section into another section. Okay, I just drag it out, it's okay. Um, I'm gonna get rid of the calls to action because we don't need them. I'm gonna get rid of the intro because we don't need it. And I'm left with these process cards. Now, what you're gonna say is, Kevin, there's no media element, but in the frames version, there's a media element. Okay, the frames version gave you a little extra uh, in case you needed it. If you don't need it, it's so easy to get rid of. So we open all the cards. There's our media wrapper right there, delete. Here's the media wrapper of this one, delete. Here's the media wrapper of this one, delete. Go ahead and hit save. And what are we left with? Three process cards that have a centered number, a centered heading, and centered text. Here they are, centered number, center heading, centered text. Okay, so we are exactly where we need to be. Now let's talk about the background color here. Is every process section like that gonna have the ice white background color, the base ultra light that we talked about earlier? Very possible. It actually doesn't hurt us to set it that way. So I'm gonna grab the class, I'm gonna go to background and I'm gonna choose base uh, right here, but I'm gonna choose the ultra light and I can actually preview what's happening as I hover these. I want the ultra light, the lightest version of the base color possible. Base ultra light right there, save, go to the front end, let's check it out. Now, one thing you're gonna say is, well, this is a lot lighter than the one you just added. Doesn't matter, because I can change it at any point in time. That's what's beautiful about automatic CSS. I just have to make sure that I'm using the right colors in the right context. So base here, base ultralight here. I wouldn't want to use, you know, a shade here or um, base medium here, because this isn't a medium shade. It's a very, very, very light shade. So as long as I use the correct name of the shade, I'm gonna be perfectly fine. I can dial this in anytime I want to. Down here, you're gonna see that this is a white background. And we're gonna move on to this section now. So I am looking for a image, media, just media, could be a video, could be an image. I don't really care what it is, it's just media. Media that's being overlapped by a card. Now in my mind, normally this would be almost like a testimonial kind of situation. You got the person's photo or headshot, you've got their quote right here. This is obviously different content, but that's the kind of category that I would expect something like this to be in first. Of course, it could also be a feature card. So I'm gonna look in maybe the feature category, definitely gonna look in the testimonials category. Maybe even the call to action category would have a frame that suits this kind of layout. The important thing that I'm looking for is can I find media that's being overlapped by content? That's what I'm looking for, okay? So I'm gonna hop back over. I'm gonna go back into the builder and we are going to click on the library, remote templates. I'm just gonna search the testimonials first. So I'll just do the word testimonial and I'm just gonna scroll around and I actually see media overlapped by content right here with testimonial card hotel but I'm not quite sure about that because the content is, it's a very minimal amount of content. I'm not sure that that's gonna get us where we wanna go. I'm gonna keep going, oh, oh, I see right here. Testimonial Foxtrot. Now, it's obviously much bigger media and it is a smaller content card, but I know that frames is, they're all built with CSS Grid. And I know that Grid is very easy to manipulate. Okay, but what's what's the important part that I said I was looking for? That it has media with that's being overlapped by content. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and put that in 
and we're gonna see if we can get to where we need to go. Let's just go ahead and uh, swap the content out, grab that image right there. And remember, I'm just working on structure right now. So what I wanna do, I also need to decide, do I need this little intro area? And if I go back, we see, no, there is no intro. So I can just grab that, delete, it's gone, problem solved. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab um, testimonial card Foxtrot, and you see right here, let me zoom in, it's telling me, hey, there's CSS involved with this testimonial card Foxtrot. So I know that I need to activate the class, hop over to the CSS area, and let's take a look at what is going on over here. So you can see that we are displaying this as a grid. So we've created the card with a grid. The media and the, and the text part are both in a grid. It is a 12 column grid. In fact, the notes right here say, items are placed in a 12 column grid. Adjust their position by adjusting the row and column starts and ends below. We built it like this because we knew people would want to make adjustments to the grid and to the placement of items within the grid. I'm gonna walk you through exactly how this works. You, you know, you do want to know what you're doing. This is not just a pure beginner tool. You are going to want to know like, hey, what's CSS grid? Hey, what's Flexbox, right? You, you want to know a little bit how some of this works, but it's also very intuitive, okay? And you'll see exactly what I mean as we as we work through this, okay? The, the thing that we have to ask ourselves, okay? We're going to come down here and just kind of decipher this for a second. This is the media, okay? So media is obviously the image. It's starting on row one of this grid. Remember, there's 12 rows to the grid, which actually 13 is the end of a 12 row grid. The number 13 is the end of a 12 row grid. Uh, same thing with columns. The column 13 is the end of a 12 column grid. So it starts on row one and ends more or less at the end of the grid, okay? So all we have to do is flip over here and look at this and say, well, this starts on row one, but does it end on row 12 or 13? No, it ends well before that. It ends after the halfway mark, which is like six or seven. So I probably wanna choose a number like eight or nine for where this image needs to end as far as its rows. So grid row end instead of 12, why don't I just try eight and see what happens, okay? Now we're gonna take a look at the column for this picture. Starts on column one, ends on column 10, almost all the way to the end of the grid. Let me flip back over. When you're looking at this square right here, does the image start on column one? Yes. Does it end on column 10 somewhere over here? No, it does not. Where does it end? Well, here's halfway, six or seven. We need to be like maybe five or four. I don't even know. I don't even care, okay? We're, gonna, we're just gonna dial this in as we go. So let's just start with five and see what happens. And now you see, I, wait, I get a much smaller photo, don't I, right? Because it's using different portions of the grid now. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll down and look at my content. So the content starts on row four, ends on row 10. I'm gonna switch over. Does this start on row four? Eh, maybe, maybe. End on row 10? Eh, maybe. Kind of, kind of close. Let's just leave the row and in starts the way that they are. What about grid column? Does it start on column seven and end at the end of the grid? Uh, no, not really. Um, I would say it starts more around four or five and it ends at the end, okay? We can actually make this the end, 13. Uh, we need to start this at maybe four or five. And here's how I know which number to choose. Since this ends at column five, if I want them to overlap, I need to start this one at four and it'll automatically have an overlap, okay? So all I've done is adjust some grid starts and grid ends by looking at the ratios of how much this piece of content is taking up in the grid and how much this piece of content is taking up in the grid. And I get an overlap. Let's zoom out here and see where we're at with our overlap. Now, I am achieving the overlap. Let's, let's go ahead and grab this class and change its background color. We wanna get this to be the base, okay? We want to make sure all of the typography is set to be white and we need to get rid of the content that we don't need. So this name wrapper right here, I'm gonna zoom in, see that name wrapper down there? We don't need that. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. What I do need to do is add the missing content. I was missing a button and missing a heading. So we're gonna go ahead and add those items in. I'm gonna add a heading and I'm gonna add a button. And my button, guys, what class is it gonna get right off the bat? Button action, you already know it, okay? Here's the heading right here. I'm gonna give this heading a class. 
what class am I gonna give this heading? And why am I gonna give this heading a class? Because everything in frames has its own class. This is FR testimonial card Foxtrot, double underscore content wrapper. So here's the content wrapper. Here's FR testimonial card Foxtrot, double underscore quote. So everything has its own name attached to this FR testimonial card Foxtrot. So what I'm gonna do is say FR testimonial card Foxtrot, double underscore, heading, just to follow the exact same naming convention so everything is nice and consistent. And the color of that heading is gonna be white. Now I'm gonna drag that into its position and I'm also free, it says be the first to test. Okay, so it's gonna say be the first to test. And then I'm gonna grab this content right here so all of our content is the same. Bam, and then what does our, it says apply for access. Apply for access, okay? Now I've got the exact content in. I'm gonna go refresh and look where we are at now. What I see is the image is a little bit bigger. Um, and so what we can do is just make a quick adjustment. I'm gonna zoom in for you again. We're gonna come down here. And for the media, the column end, I think I want this to be six. And immediately that image is going to get bigger. I can go ahead and uh, go out now, refresh on the front end. And guys, I mean, Maybe what we need now is just a little bit more breathing room in this card, and I think we're gonna be spot on. So I see right now that this is using space L for our padding. Space L is looking good, but we need a little bit more spacing. So I'm gonna see what, it's, what happens when I take this to space XL. Save, refresh on the front end. Look, it's overlapping a little too much, okay? So I can still dial this in. Now I'm gonna change the card start. So the card starts on four, I'm gonna start the card on five, and now we're gonna have less of an overlap. And if I toggle back and forth, I mean, guys, I don't even get this close when I shave, okay? Like this is, for starting with a frame that was not even designed like for this exact layout, what I was able to do, and remember, the website width is different. I'm using 1168, they're using like 1108 or something like that. So I've got 60 pixels of extra room and more or less created an exact replica of what they've got going on here. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is, I'm, I'm tired of these buttons having the wrong color. So we're gonna make our first adjustment to automatic CSS. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna go to automatic CSS, I'm gonna go to buttons, I'm gonna come down to the action button, and I'm gonna open the edit action button styling area. I've got the correct background color, what's missing is the base color as our text color. And then if we look at what's gonna happen when we hover, we're supposed to get an outline button on hover. And this is another question that a lot of people have. Can automatic CSS really handle stuff like this, where we go from a solid button with a different color text to an outline button? Yes, it's very, very easy in automatic CSS. So here's our background color, which is already fine and dandy, but our hover background color is wrong. It, what we need for an outline button on hover is a transparent background color. So I'm gonna write the word transparent. And now on hover, I'm gonna have a transparent background color. My text color, clearly wrong. I wanna use our base color. So I'm just throwing in our variables, our tokens into these areas. Our hover text color also needs to be our action color. So I'm gonna drop that in right there because you see when it's the outline button on hover, it's the action color for the text color. Uh, which would actually probably be the action hover color at that point. Okay, so I'm gonna put in action hover, and then our hover border color is also gonna be action hover, so the text and the border on hover match. Okay, outline hover text color is gonna be action hover. Okay, we're gonna save this, and we're gonna go to the front end and just see if, look at that, I mean, guys, come on. It's too easy, it's too easy, okay? Um, Let's see if our variable font is uh, is working now. So I, I don't, like I said, I don't, I don't do much with variable fonts. What if I choose 600? Is our button gonna get bolder? It is, okay, well, all right, we're, we're rocking and rolling. Um, I mean, how easy, how easy was that? It looks, the buttons look almost exactly the same. This one has a little bit more top and bottom padding than our button. So very easy to fix. See the button padding right here under button defaults? Here's the top, the Y axis. Here's the left and right, the X axis. I'm just gonna make this one M, save changes. Just kind of dialing in what we're doing for our buttons. Once again, guys, I don't even get that close when I shave. I'm just, I'm, I'm just guessing here. I'm just putting in 
you know, relative units, right? I didn't even look at the pixels. I don't even care. I'm just eyeballing it and get, getting the essence of the design that I was given, making sure that we're still achieving proper balance, proper rhythm. Okay, what else do we need to do next? Uh, this, this heading right here uh, is probably an H2 heading. This is an H3 heading. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this an H2 because there's also no section heading in here. And so that out of the box, guys, is pretty much looking like it's matching. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, we're, we're, doing, we're doing fantastic. Let's see if we can achieve this little circular uh, design here for these uh, process cards. And I wanna show you something really cool about our process cards. In frames, we know that process cards are process cards, and if you make more of them, it's a pain in the butt to change the numbers, especially if you wanna reorder or reshuffle your, your cards around. Let me go ahead and put this content in, and then I'm gonna show you something really cool. So actionable insights, data-driven decisions, always affordable. Actionable insights. Okay, I'm gonna grab the step of this process card. And the first thing I'm gonna do is come down. I know that you know these didn't really have any structure, but these need to be a perfect square if I wanna achieve this circle effect. So I'm gonna, you can do this two different ways. I'm gonna put a width of 2M on here and I'm just throwing in um, random values to see what we get. And then I'm gonna put a border on this. The border is gonna be one pixels on all sides. It's gonna be a solid border and it's gonna be our base color, at least for right now. Um, and I'm seeing here, when I refreshed, we don't actually have a perfect square. So I'm gonna go to the next step of trying something different. Uh, height 2M and width 2M did not work. I'm gonna come down and use aspect ratio. So let me zoom in for you guys. We're gonna go with root. We're just gonna write a little bit of CSS, aspect ratio one to one. And that's gonna force me to have a square for this, okay? Which is, which is pretty good. Let me zoom back out. And you can see some text in here in the builder. That's a, th kind of throwing us off a little bit. Aspect ratio one to one. It seems like that's, that's working, yeah? Okay. Um, let's go to border radius and do 50%, which makes a circle. Okay, yeah, we're getting a circle right there. I also wanna go to layout, and I, I know that I wanna use a flex layout for this. So I'm gonna go display this as flex, and then I just wanna align everything to the center. I also wanna make sure that with our typography, we're zeroing out our line height, or basically, you know, making our line height uh, one. All right, let's go here. All right, it doesn't feel like it's respecting this width. Let's do like 10 rem. What is it doing with this 10 rem? Ah, okay, we're gonna use height. Let's do 2m. We actually do want it to be in m's uh, because they'll scale, uh, the height will scale with the font size. So that's that actually works perfectly. Let's refresh, that's really good. I don't like the period that's in here because our design doesn't have a period either. What we're gonna do is go to CSS and figure out, oh, look at this. This is where this period is coming from right here. Um, all I have to do is take that out, hit save, and I am good to go. No more period in our headings. And it looks to me like it's using that heading font for this. Uh, Francais, yes, it is, okay? So on Bravo Step, I am gonna go to typography and I'm gonna choose Francais. Here it is right there, perfect. Uh, I bet it's also a heavier font weight too. Oh, it only has 400 available for us for Francais. Um, is it a different size? So let's go to Figma and check. It is a different size, okay. So let's hop back here. And what we need to do is just make our, and, and this is where, you know, what size is it? Well, I don't really care. I'm hooking it into the automatic CSS system. I know that it's, if, if it doesn't have a font size in here, then it's basically our medium text size, our base text size. So I can go one up from that, which is text L. And I'm just gonna see if I get the look that I'm going for. Go ahead and hit save, refresh. And I think, again, again, I mean, it's, it's so close, right? We're following the essence of what we were given from the designer. I am seeing a little bit more space between the numbers and our headings than what we're what we have by default. What we have by default is even spacing by default. This is easily fixable. I'm just gonna go up to process card Bravo heading and I'm gonna go add a little bit of margin top to it. How much? Well, we could use automatic CSS spacing variable or we can just say like 0.5M. Uh, we can say 1M. Really, you know, for a situation like this, it doesn't matter. Just use relative variables. Just use relative variables, you're good to go. It's that easy, right? We don't have to overcomplicate, overthink everything. All right, you know what I wanna tackle next? I wanna tackle these shape dividers. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in, and again, this is, you know, Shape Divider is not even part of automatic CSS. It's just general web development stuff. I'm going to go down to, I'm going to grab the section, and I'm going to go down to Shape Dividers, and I'm going to add a Shape Divider, and we're going to see what Bricks has for us. And what I'm looking for is a curve. And actually, in my mind right now, I'm, I'm starting to remember that I was looking for this at a different point in time on a different project, and I was like, why don't they have a curve? They have all these fancy ones, and they don't have a simple curve. Okay, so I think what we can do, let's use this opportunity to figure out how to make and manage a custom shape divider. So I'm gonna go to shape divider generator. I use this from time to time as well, really, really handy. And this one does have a curve. Um, I don't care what the color is. I do want it to be on the bottom. I do want to invert it because I want it to scoop up like that, just like it's doing in our design right here. Notice the curve doesn't match exactly. Ugh, huh, kind of a problem, but you know, little brain, little experience. We can fix that up. We can, we can make it work, okay? And this is going to be a really great, fantastic lesson for you. All right, so let's go ahead and just grab our code the way it is. I'm going to grab the shape divider div, all right? So grab this, and we're actually, let's just put this in here as a code block. All right, I'm gonna walk you through this. Don't worry, don't sweat. Some of you are sweating bullets again like it's like you're the pilot in airplane. And uh, you don't need to be, okay? One, you're with me, you're with me. So we're gonna be just fine. Number two, you know, this kind of stuff is the life you're gonna live as a web developer. You gotta, you gotta know what to do in these situations. Okay, so we've got our code. I'm gonna name this shape divider. And then I'm going to actually drop in our code. So get rid of everything that's there, paste in the code, hit execute code, hit render without wrapper. We don't need any extra divs and all this other nonsense going on. In fact, I don't even need these divs right here. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that div. I just want the SVG, my guy, that's all I want. So let's go ahead and hit save. And uh, now what I need to do is I need to check on their CSS. So we're gonna go over here and let's see what they're giving us for some CSS. And this is why I've said, you know, Page Building 101, I have a whole free course called Page Building 101. I said, you gotta know how to read CSS and you gotta know how to write some CSS in order to be a professional web developer. Or, you know, anybody that's gonna take money for this kind of work, you gotta know what you're doing, all right? In CSS, you don't have to know JavaScript, you don't have to know PHP, but my guy, my girl, you gotta learn CSS. You gotta know what you're looking at when it comes to styling a website. All right, I'm gonna create a new style sheet. It's gonna be a SAS style sheet right here. And we're gonna call this styling. And we are going to hit save. We're gonna say minify the output, auto reload changes, external file load, save, activate. And now we are ready to rock and roll. We're gonna say, there's a little comment here that this is gonna be our shape divider. And we're gonna drop in the code. Oh my gosh, so scary. <laughs> Okay, well, we see that there's a class for the shape divider. We see that we use that same class. Look how Codebox is highlighting all three lines to let me know these are exactly the same. One thing is targeting the SVG that's inside of this, and another is targeting the shape fill that is inside of this. So I know right off the bat, this class name ain't gonna fly. That ain't gonna work, because I can't, nobody can remember that. We're gonna create our own shape divider name. We're creating a divider that is curved. Are you with me? Okay, so I'm gonna write divider curved. Does that make sense? You you're still with me? Now, I'll give you a little, uh, little trick here. Command D, Command D again, selects all three of those rows because they're exactly equal. And this is called multi-cursor editing. Check this out. I'm gonna hit period and I'm gonna hit divider and I'm gonna do dash curved. What I need to do in the builder is add divider curved to this. I'm gonna save, I'm gonna refresh so that this can act. Oh, did I not add that? There we go. Save. Let me refresh the entire builder so that it can access what we're doing in WP Code Box now. And notice it's already starting to take shape, right? It's already starting. You saw a little glimpse of it back there starting to work, but we need to figure out what else is going on. Okay. So I know that this is position absolute, which means I need to anchor it to a parent, which means I need to anchor it to this hero section right here. So what I could do is go to style, layout, position, relative, <gasps> and now my shape divider shows up, but I don't wanna be a chump. I don't, I don't wanna have to do that on every single hero, every single section, right, that I add a shape divider to. I mean, that is a pain in the butt. 
So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go over here. Let's take away that position relative. Our shape divider disappears. I'm going to teach you something that's brand new to CSS, but it is magical. It's called has. And we're going to say has, and then we're just going to put in the name of the class. If this, if anything, I didn't even say what it is. I just said, if anything has a shape divider, right? Divider curved. Um, then we're going to do something to it. What are we going to do to it? We're going to position it relative. I'm going to hit save. Magic, magic. It's detecting that this section has a, a class in it called divider curved, which it does. And it's setting that to position relative. It's fixing it for us automagically. I love has in CSS. One of the greatest things since uh, CSS sliced bread. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, now notice that I just need to give my divider a color. Okay, so over here, divider curved, shape fill has a fill of white. Oh gosh, all right. So what I, kn I know in my mind, because I'm a BIM fan, B-E-M, block element modifier, I need modifier classes for these because there's gonna be multiple different color options to choose from. So I'm gonna say divider curve double dash, that's how you define a modifier. White is gonna create a white fill. Then I'm gonna copy, paste, and I'm gonna say base ultralight because I need a base ultralight version of my um, divider. Now, what is the fill gonna be for base ultralight? Any guesses? Any guesses? Could it possibly be base ultralight? You don't even need to know the hex codes for the shades or anything like that. You don't have to look them up. You just have to know, hey, my base ultralight divider is gonna be base ultralight. And my white divider, by the way, is gonna be white and I'm gonna hit save. So now I've got two classes that I can use along with my main class. And look right here, it just changed to black. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here, grab my shape divider, divider curved, divider curved, double dash, and this one base ultra light because I need to match the color that is right below it, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and refresh, I'm hoping that we are gonna get a uh, our, our stuff working here. All right, now we're gonna have to problem solve because it clearly did not change the color. It actually did something else to, <clears throat> to this. Shape, bricks, border color, okay. Um, SVG. Oh, you know what? I don't, maybe because I got rid of the wrapper. Hang tight, hang tight. Okay, so over here for shape divider, Render without wrapper, that might have been an oopsie. We may not want to toggle that. We may, we may in fact, we do in fact need the wrapper. Okay, so now I inspect this. All right, there's our divider curve, divider curve, base ultra light. Oh, I misspelled the class name. Oh my gosh, silly, silly me. Okay, ultra light, now we're working. Okay, see the philosophy was there. It's just, you can't make typos. Typos in CSS aren't always very friendly. Okay, there's one more problem we have to solve with the shape divider. All right, let's go ahead and look at the width of uh, divider curved. The width of divider curved is 100%. The width of the SVG in divider curved has a calc on it. I don't want my main wrapper to overflow the section if it doesn't have to. What I'd rather have is that uh, container, more or less, stay the width of my website and whatever's in it can break out and then I can hide the overflow, which they're already doing right here. So just a little bit of code inspection, a little CSS inspection kind of lets me know what they want me to do with this, okay? I can zoom in on this, by the way, to make it even easier for you guys to see. If I make this calc, uh, let me let me kind of talk you through this, okay? If I take this divider that's sharp, sharply curved, and I stretch it, I'm only gonna see a shallow part of the curve. You get me? So what I'm gonna do is stretch this by saying, no, don't be 100%, be like 150%. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit save on that. And then we're gonna go back and we are going to refresh. Oh, it did it, but it's still anchored on the left and it stretched it all the way that way. If I center everything now, I should get exactly what I want. So there's a trick to centering with relative or absolutely positioned items. You go 50% from the left, then you transform it and you translate it across the X axis minus 50%. 
Guys, there we go. We have stretched it out. We have centered it. We have a shallower curve. Now our curve is not tall enough. So now we need to make the curve go taller. That's easily fixed. Let's just try, uh, let's try 250 instead of 300. We don't want to go too crazy. And that is getting really, really good. Let me uh, go back to Figma. It's a little steeper. It's a little bit steeper. Maybe 300 was the right thing to go with. Uh, I think that is absolutely perfect. Okay, so now what we need to do, we need to take our shape divider right here. We need to duplicate it. Nope, nope, don't bookmark it. Duplicate it and then put it inside of process section Bravo. So now it's in process section Bravo. And instead of divider curve base ultra light, it needs to be divider curved white and give us a white shape divider. Look at that. Now we have two shape divider sections, just like we have right here. The only problem we're running into now is we don't have our overlapping image, which we're gonna tackle in just a second. And we don't have, uh, I don't think we have proper visual balance with our spacing in this section because the divider right here eats into that section and the divider up here appears to give it more space at the top. So the dividers are causing a little bit of a mismatch. Let's tackle this overlapping phone thing first. Uh, let me get back to Figma here. We need a pretty significant overlap of this device into this section down here. And if we do that first, then we'll be able to easily figure out what we need to maybe adjust with the spacing in this section. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go back to here. I, I need to get this flipping back properly. Okay, there we go. Uh, well, one is the phone is just too wide, right? Right off the bat, the phone is way wider than it needs to be. This says 767 on the width. So I'm gonna grab the media wrapper itself. And I noticed that this says with XL. I can just clear that out uh, with 767. Let's go ahead and see. Well, it's actually almost exact. Um, or what if I do 640? Actually, nothing appears to be changing the media wrapper with. What is going on with the media? Let's refresh Bricks. Sometimes Bricks loses its mind a little bit. Okay, media wrapper, media wrapper. Let's go layout with 64. There, yeah, Bricks had lost its mind for a second. 767. That should work just fine. Now I'm free to just use some bottom margin. Uh, I'm going to do this on the media element itself if I can. Let's do like minus 200. Okay, that's not working. Let's do it on the media wrapper. Minus 200, does it work? Okay, we're working there, perfect. Okay, 200 is clearly way too big, isn't it? Um, I'm gonna do a variable from automatic CSS. I want this overlap to basically be relative to our section padding. So I'm gonna teach you how to take your section padding variable and make it a negative. We're gonna use a calc function. Let me zoom in on this so you guys can see. Okay, calc. I'm gonna put the variable inside here for section space M. That's our default section spacing. And then I'm gonna multiply that by negative one. And that's gonna give me the opposite. It's gonna give me a negative value. And now, I mean, come on, let's just, let me zoom out here. This is like a perfect overlap. I'm missing a little bit down here. That's bottom section padding. So I'm gonna come down here, not to the class, because I'm only doing this in this one section because it has a shape divider. This class, this section may not always have a shape divider. So I'm gonna do this at the ID level. I'm gonna say instead of section space M, which is default, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say L, which is large. It's like one step up and it's gonna give me a larger bottom padding down there. And now this is perfectly balanced. I want the header and I want the footer now. Okay, so for my header, what am I looking for? I can, maybe frames can help us out here. I want a logo on the left. I want a call to action on the right. Okay, so I am going to go out of here. We're gonna go into our templates area now. And this has to be an overlay header, mind you. So this is gonna be interesting to see how we figure this out. Go to templates, go to header, just add a header, assign it to the header area, hit publish, hit edit with bricks, and let's just open up frames, okay? We can go to uh, headers. So let's find our headers area. There we are. And let's just look, here's header Bravo, has a menu, a logo, and a CTA. Let's go insert header Bravo. Oh, it's got this top row up here. Well, guess what? We don't need the top row. Delete. Um, oh, it's got a nav. Oh, we don't need the nav. Delete. And then we're left with exactly what we need. 
Uh, let's go ahead and take this off of here. Let's take this off of here. Let's say button action. Is that actually a button up there? <gasps> it is not a button, it's a link. Okay, I'm just gonna delete the button then. Let's add the text link. There it is, right there. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so we're gonna say, um, this is what? Header Bravo, FR header Bravo. So I'm gonna call this FR header Bravo, double underscore uh, CTA. That's our call to action. And actually I'm thinking about this more now. No, 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 no. This is probably what all links, there's only one of them. But this is probably what all links would look like, uh, all CTA links like this would look like on a web, on this website part in particular. So I'm gonna actually make this a link class. Let's do this, link action. There's already a link action class. I'm gonna hijack it <laughs> and, and we're gonna customize it. So I'm gonna unlock it. Oh my God, I'm going rogue. I'm unlocking an automatic CSS utility class. So link action. And what I actually want is I want the typography to be white, okay? So we're gonna go white with the typography, perfect. And then I am going to underline this link. So we're gonna go to typography and we're gonna go to underline. And then what I wanna do, and this control is actually not in bricks. So what we have to do is we gotta go off the beaten path. We gotta go a little, ah, I can't zoom in too much because I wanna see what I'm doing up there. Okay, so we're gonna go to root. And so this is targeting link the link action class. And I wanna say text, I believe it's decoration color. And then I just need to reference our action color. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. It's right there. It's so great. So that's the text decoration color. And then I need to say text. Um, it's text. Is it text underline width or text decoration width? Text underline width. Five pixels text decoration width. Dex, text decoration size. Text, what is it? Okay, let's go here. Why Why am I seeing those? Okay, let's go CSS text decoration uh, width. Thickness, thickness. Okay, sometimes you gotta look stuff up. Text decoration, because I don't use this very often. Text decoration thickness. And then there's text decoration offset, I believe. 0 0.025.0025M. Okay, text. See, they don't do a good job of the naming conventions with these. Text underline offset. Okay, so now we gotta look that up. Text underline offset CSS. It is text underline offset. Okay, so I had it right. Text underline offset 0.5. Okay, there it is. Now, now we got it, 0.25. I like it, I like it. Now what we're gonna do is we are going to take the background color off of this frame. So just delete the background color and it's gonna be an overlay header. So we're gonna to go to settings, uh, theme settings, header, header location, sticky sticky header, yes. Okay, sticky on scroll, no. Um, transition, I don't need that yet. We need this header to be on the entire website. Let's go ahead and hit save. Let's go to our homepage. Guys, we have a floating logo. There's our underline offset text link there. Um, what we need to do though is change that thickness. That thickness was a little aggressive. So I'm gonna go two pixels on the thickness. Let's go back, there's our two pixels. Let's check on our Figma. Okay, clearly we need more offset and we need thicker text and probably bigger text, okay? So this is actually gonna be text L. So it's gonna be a text that's a little bit bigger. If that's too big, we're, we can adjust it. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. Um, and we need to make sure that this is our font weight of 700, so it's a little bit bolder. And look at that. And I would say, just eyeballing it, it's a little too big, okay? So no problem. Automatic CSS to the rescue. We use a calc. We're gonna take our normal text size, text M, and just multiply it by like 1.1, make it like 10% bigger, 15% bigger, somewhere in there. And now we should be absolutely Perfect, okay, so it says apply for access. So we're gonna pop in the actual text here. I'm not actually gonna bother making it a link. Apply for access, I mean, we, I guess we can. External URL, pound sign, save, bam, just like that. We need that offset to be a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna go down to our offset where we had 0.25, let's do 0.45. All right, let's look, let's look. I, I love it, I absolutely love it. I think the thickness is actually like around 2.5. 
if I'm just really like, you know, being anal about this. Okay, looking really good. Um, what is this? Can I export this or do I already have this as a logo? I bet I already have it. Let's swap this logo file out and let's go. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, content right here. There it is. White version of the logo in place. Bam. It's a little too big, isn't it? So let's figure out the height of that logo. 25 pixels is the height. So I'm going to go to FR logo. All of our logos are going to be the same height on this website. And we're going to go to layout height, 25 pixels. So we have work it. We have apply for access. It's nice and sticky. We do need sticky on scroll. And what we're going to do is for sticky on scroll or background on scroll, excuse me. And I've actually had trouble with this in the past. So I'm going to, I'm going to select this colors. I'm going to do our base color. Um, we're going to see if this will actually bricks for some reason in the past has given me trouble. Yep. See, it's not applying sticky on scroll. So I'm going to show you how to work around this. I think this is a bug in bricks. So we're going to inspect this element, this header right here, and we're going to see it has class sticky and then it gets this class scrolling. So I'm going to say that the bricks header right here, when it's scrolling needs to have a background color. So I'm going to come over here and say that we're fixing the header. So we're going to put in the uh, ID of Bricks header when it's scrolling. So I'm going to attach the class to it and say your background color needs to be var base. Okay, let's just go ahead and see. Guys, we're, we're done. We're fixed. Now look at this. We have a problem. Anytime you have an overlay header, it's going to take up space in your hero section and your it's going to look off. All of your spacing is going to look off. We need a way to offset our content in our hero from the sticky header. That's the exact height of the header. And that's actually quite complicated to do unless you're using automatic CSS. Look at the height of our header is 90 pixels. I'm going to go over here into automatic CSS. I'm going to go over into additional styling. I'm going to go into header heights and I'm going to say, Hey, my header height is 90 pixels. And then I'm going to toggle this little button that says offset page content automatically. And if I zoom in here, it says offset your page content to account for the height of your header. Note header height values must be filled out above only use when header is position absolute or fixed, or in this case, sticky. Toggle on, save changes. I can zoom out. Watch what's happened to my my hero area. I got my spacing back and I'm going to have it by default on every page now. This is the kind of stuff we've built into automatic CSS to solve common challenges. We know that when you use overlay headers, it is a common challenge that you lose spacing in your hero section. And we have a toggle switch to put that spacing back for you. So you don't have to do all the custom CSS work that is required to make that happen on every single page. I need a footer in here now. Okay. Let's go down and let's go to my templates, bricks, templates. Let's go add new footer. Let's go publish this. We need to assign it to our footer area. And I am looking once again for a footer that has a logo and social icons in it. Not a big ask, not a big ask. Okay, so let's start this, go to templates, frames, footer, see what's available. Look at this right here, footer, Delta, caught my eye right off the bat. It just has a bunch of stuff that I don't need. So I'm going to keep the logo, get rid of the nav, don't need it. Keep the icons, get rid of the legal stuff. Save, perfect. I'm going to uh, adjust our gap that's in here. So it's the container gap, right? I want the container gap, but I want half of it. So I'm gonna divide the container gap by two. Bam, bam, thank you, ma'am. Insert, save. What are these colors? They are, they are the uh, base color, okay? So we are gonna grab this and color of our icon is going to be uh, base medium, base medium. And that's gonna look absolutely terrible right now. Why? Because we haven't configured base medium and we haven't configured base ultra light. We're gonna make these adjustments as we go on the fly. Okay, so this is good. Do they need to hover? Uh, they just change to base when you hover, okay? No problem whatsoever. So that's my header template, I can get rid of that. So here, when I hover, so I'm going to go to style. Let's just go to here, hover, typography. Uh, actually, it's going to be color of the icon, colors, and I'm going to go to base, just base on hover. There you go. So let's go see if that hover works. 
It does. Miraculous, just like that. By the way, these are automatically accessible. So they have hidden accessibility text in them so that they are announced properly. Um, which icons do we need? Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So there's Facebook, Instagram, and there's no Twitter. Okay, so we're gonna delete YouTube because we don't need it. We're gonna hijack TikTok, okay? And we're gonna put in the Twitter icon. There's the Twitter icon right there. That's the one we want. And then I'm gonna go change the hidden accessibility text to follow us on Twitter. And that's all you need to do. Now, didn't, didn't Twitter come second? It did. So look, you just take this, make sure this is named Twitter, drag this before Instagram, and now they're gonna switch orders, and now you refresh, and you're, we're exactly what we need. Now, guys, we need to dial in the colors. My fault. We need to put in data tailored to your needs, and we gotta do that little accent underline, too. Okay, let's edit this page with bricks. It needs to say data tailored to your needs. Perfect. And then is that two lines? It is, and it's bigger? Okay, no worries. So this is, if I had to check this text, heading L, 80 pixels. Okay, watch how easy this is. I'm gonna go back into automatic CSS here. While we're here, I'm gonna do the typography for our heading size. I'm gonna go to heading size override, H1, 80, save. Now I go to the front end, watch what happens to my H1. Now it's, now it's 80. Now I just need to limit the text length of that. I'm gonna do this at the ID level. Width of 20 characters, 10 characters. Looks like 10 characters to me. We'll do the job. I need to tighten up the line spacing on our headings. Look, we can do that in automatic CSS as well. Line height for heading one. We need this to just be one instead of 1 1.2. And it is going to tighten up that line spacing for us. Okay. That's looking really good. That button needs to say learn more, which is a terrible, terrible text for a button, by the way, for a CTA. Never say learn more. That is lazy, lazy, lazy. Next thing I need to do, what was I gonna do next? Uh, I, oh, the colors, that's correct, okay. So this, if we go back to our brand palette, check this out. The ice white, the ultra light base is 276 on the hue, okay? So I'm gonna go over to ACSS. Look how easy this is. Palette, we need to be under base, edit base shades, ultra light. Here's the hue right here. What's it need to say? 276. So I'm gonna make a slight adjustment to the hue. I'm gonna make 100% on the saturation. And then my lightness is gonna be 99. And now my color, what did I do here? 100? What was I supposed to do there? I just hit the wrong thing. Yeah, it's supposed to be 100. Okay, so 276, 199, save changes. Now I'm gonna go to the homepage. Watch this section right here. It might be hard for you to see um, on because of the contrast. And Figma renders it actually a little bit better. So what I'm gonna do is tone down the, the lightness a little bit. Okay, the saturation does not need to be at 100. Let's go saturation of 50. And see, there we go. Now we're getting there. And I need to get this up to like 98. Save. Yeah, there we go. We're just dialing this in. 97. Save. I want you guys to be able to see it too, because I know the based on the resolution. There you go. Look at this. Look at this. Absolutely fantastic. And anywhere I use that base ultralight color would have these same exact updates, right? So like I said in the beginning, you can change these. We're at the end of the build and I'm making adjustments and nothing is gonna break. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, now that base medium color, what is up with that? Okay, so I am gonna go back here and we're gonna focus on this medium shade right here. I'm gonna go over and it's this. So 271 on the hue. So this needs to go from 273 to 271. The saturation goes to 12. The lightness goes to 34, 12, 34, save. Now, the only thing that that was applied to is these icons down here, hit refresh, look at that. They are now the correct color. They still hover properly. After the build was done, I was able to dial that in. That's really powerful, nothing is broken. Okay, I'm gonna do the little accent on this to show you how that's done. And then, which is, uh, let's go over here, this little underline here, which is the same underline as there, by the way. Uh, and then these, these things. We're gonna call that a highlight. So I'm gonna come in here and under Taylor, let me zoom in for you guys here. I'm gonna put a span with a class of highlight. Okay, and then I have to end the span 
That's gonna wrap that word in a span tag called highlight. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go back out. Easier for me to do it in Codebox. So I'm gonna open styling. I'm gonna come down here and give myself a comment, highlight style. And then we're gonna call this highlight, right? And I can go ahead and let me zoom in on this. So here's what we're gonna do. Basically the same stuff we did to our link before which I would normally create a mix in for this. And oh, oh, we're not going into all that territory, okay? So I need to do text uh, text decoration, underline. And now we're in code box, so it actually suggests the correct things for me. Um, so I need to say text underline offset. There it is. It even writes it for me. Uh, 0.25M, actually it was 0.35M, if I remember correctly. And then text decoration color is gonna be var action, our action color. Let's zoom out and see how we're doing. Hey, look at that. That's too aggressive on the offset. Uh, let's look at our Figma. All right, and I need text underline thickness. Text underline text decoration thickness. There it is right there. Uh, select it, thank you. Text decoration thickness. Do we need to do, we need to do this in M's, I would imagine, because it needs to kind of scale with the text size. Woo, boy, that is way too big. 025M. Uh, that is much, much, much better. It needs to be like 0.03M. Okay, if we want to really dial that in. See, this is the thing you can't really do in um, Figma either. You can't translate this over from Figma because Figma doesn't even have M units in it. So you just have to eyeball it. Another reason why pixel perfect design is not even a thing. 0.035M, uh, I'm liking that. Let's go front end and view it there. The offset is way off, okay? Our offset at 0.25M needs to be like 0.15. All right, now this is the extra credit portion of the lesson. Uh, we are gonna be dealing with these little things, these little guys right here. And in my mind, I mean, you could just slap these on the page and position them absolute. But in my mind, we're, you know, we're building an entire site. We're not just building a landing page. I want best practices. I want scalability. I want maintainability. I want a class that I can just pop on and it's going to add these bad boys in here. Um, so what I'm going to say is uh, this is going to be mm, accent. We're going to call this our accent item or our, we're just going to call this accent. So accent before and accent after. This is gonna be our before, this is gonna be our after. We can manipulate their position on the fly depending on where we need them to go, but we need to get these as pseudo elements, okay? So we're gonna call these ac um, accent before and accent after. I'm gonna put this class on Hero Golf because that's where these things are gonna go for right now. So accent before, all right? And then we need an accent after as well. Now, the question is, do you guys want me to do this in bricks or do you want me to do this in uh, code box? Okay, we'll just stay in bricks. Um, all right, accent before. So we're gonna go to style, CSS. We're gonna zoom in so we can see what we're doing down here. And I just need to get something on the page. As I've said many, 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 many times, when you're working with invisible elements, you need to be able to see them, right? So this is gonna be our before. We're gonna say content here. And we are going to do a display of flex. We're gonna say a position of absolute, uh, which means we need relative on the parent item. Okay, so root, this is the parent item right here. Position needs to be relative. And then we need a size, all right? So for right now, it's gonna be a width of 500 pixels and a height of 500 pixels. It's going to be a background color of red. Cause again, I just need, there it is. I just need to get something on the page guys. Okay, let's zoom out now. There is my element. Now what we need is we actually need it to be a background image, okay? So I'm gonna say, instead of background color red, I'm gonna say background URL. And we're gonna go over here into the media library and I believe I have them, these little squiggly guys. Uh, which one is which? BG pattern one. That's, that's number one right there. Okay, so let's grab this. Let's hop over and in our URL, we're gonna slap that in. Look what I have, guys. I like to put them in quotes. Um, yeah, that's really nice, isn't it? Background size of cover, cover with our background size. I don't wanna, I don't, I wanna make sure it doesn't ever repeat. Uh, so we're gonna say no, no repeat. 
Man, oh man, oh man. What, where are we at with our size? I mean, eh, almost right on the money, right? Save, 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 save. Okay, that's, that's almost perfect. Now I need to position it. So our left is gonna be zero and our top is gonna be 50%. And we're gonna say, this is the absolute positioning trick again. Transform of translate Y minus 50%, okay? That's gonna center it in our wherever, whatever object we're putting it on, it's gonna vertically center it. And then the left, I'm seeing that we need to get this off the screen, okay? So I am going to say a left of minus uh, 200 pixels. <laughs> Uh, 160, I was so close. I was so close with the guess. There it is, that's it. That's all I, That's all you really need. Uh, let's do like 170, okay. So we have our first one in. Now I'm just gonna take all of that code, accent after, we're gonna change this to after, and then what we're gonna do is position it on the right. So right, and then we actually have to change to pattern two. There's pattern two, is that the right one? That is the right one. And this one's gonna be 200. And this one's gonna be 200. Love it, okay? And then background is the correct one. We just need to spell right properly. That always helps. And then minus uh, 100, not quite that much. 50, 60, perfection, save. Oh, I love it. I love it, guys. Okay, that, that's a little bit uh, not where it's supposed to be. So the top, I can just change to like, oh, not, not that one. Not that one. Okay, where does that one need to go? That one needs to go down a little bit. So top 60%. And then this other one, the before, needs to go like top 30 or 40 or 35, not 350. Guys, my gosh. My gosh, now, why did I make these classes? Because check this out. Let's say I'm on a different page, right? And I'm like, I want those little accent guys, right? So I can say accent before, bam, there it is. Accent after, and there it is. And then I can move on with my life, right? If they were physical elements, I would have to copy them from the other page, paste them into this page, and oh my gosh, what a nightmare. Okay, I think one other thing has it, which is, this little guy down here, and is that number three? Is that a third one? Is that a completely separate image? No, surely it's not. Oh, it is, because it's going a different direction. This goes down to the left, that goes down to the right. Oh no, that one goes down to the right too. It's just a smaller version of that one. Okay, so we can just steal that one. Um, we're gonna, and this is why we made it a class, but I'm already in my mind, I'm realizing I'm gonna have to switch to using some locally scoped variables in order to change these on the fly, okay? All right, so here's how we're gonna do it. First, I'm gonna I'm just gonna apply it and I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen, okay? So we're gonna do accent before, and there it is, it's gonna show up. But I can't come down here and edit the positioning and stuff because I'm gonna affect the other ones that I've used as well. I don't wanna do that. I want the ability to affect this uh, uh, independently, like at the ID level, okay? So what I'm gonna do is quickly on my accent befores, I, at the root level up here, this is the parent element, this is a little bit advanced, but this is, it is what it is, okay? We're doing custom development work. All right, so I'm gonna do, and we're making it scalable and maintainable. Like I said, we could do, there's an easy way to do this. This is the scalable, maintainable. Uh, it's This is easier later on, it's just a little more complicated to set up. Okay, so we're gonna call this uh, left position. All right, so left, and it's one, minus, minus 170 pixels, okay? And then we're gonna call this top, which is 35%, all right? I'm making locally scoped variables to match these things down here. Uh, we're gonna leave the transform alone. We need a width of 400 pixels and a height of 400 pixels. Okay, just like that, perfect. And I think that's all we're gonna need. All right, so now what I need to do is switch the width out with width, with var width, right? I need to switch this out with height, right? I'm just replacing what I did here. The top is gonna be top, the left is gonna be left. 
Okay, now I've got my locally scoped variables in and look, nothing is broken because everything is the, the way that it is, except for the fact that I can now steal these locally scoped variables and at, I can turn off the class and at the ID level, I can declare them again. And now I can declare them with different values. So for example, the left, let's say that this is gonna be 100%, and it should go over, I'm gonna refresh the builder. I think Bricks has uh, wigged out on us here. We've, we've done some advanced things to Bricks and Bricks is having a seizure. Um, so we're gonna go over here and we're gonna go to style. Notice it's over here now, right? It did change the uh, left position, okay? And our top position, uh, actually we need to change our width and our height. So we're gonna do 200 and 200. That's perfect, it's down there now. How does it look in our source file here? Okay, so it's actually um, left, we, we need to calculate this, 100% minus uh, 200 pixels. There you go, right there, looks really good. Okay, and then the top is 100% from the top. Where are we? Yeah, that's exactly right. So now this is 250 pixels-ish, looking really good, okay. Um, Okay, I need to pull it up just a little bit. So we need to calculate this from the top. So top is 100% minus uh, 50 pixels. No, 20 pixels. There you go, save. See how I'm affecting this independently from this one, even though they use the same exact class, that's the power of locally scoped variables. Tremendous. Guys, I think we're done here. Let's do a quick overview, overview of what we've done, okay? So we got this whole hero. Remember, Frames built this hero for us. Frames built these process cards for us. Frames built this overlapping grid element for us. We just added the colors. We had to add some custom shape dividers, mainly because Bricks didn't offer them. If it was a shape divider that Bricks actually offered out of the box, that would have been a lot less work. We had to do our own custom shape divider because Bricks didn't offer one. And um, that's that's we did the header. Frames made our header for us. Frames made our footer for us. And Automatic CSS obviously handled all of our spacing, all of our responsive text sizes, all of our colors. Everything was handled by Automatic CSS. We just had to know how to do some of the more advanced stuff like the custom shape dividers and the custom objects and things like that. That is it for this tutorial. I hope you guys got a lot out of this. If you want more of these, you gotta comment down below and request them. You have to let me know that you like this sort of thing. Otherwise, what I'm gonna focus on is, hey, here's the new feature of automatic CSS. Here's how it works. Here's how to do this thing in automatic CSS. Here's how to do this thing in frames. But if you want real world stuff like this, you gotta comment down below and let me know that you want to see more of it. If you have any questions about this build, if you have any comments about this build, if something didn't make sense, there are no dumb questions, I promise. So drop them down below, I will answer them, and that's it. So again, hope you guys got a lot out of it. I'll see you very soon with another lesson from Automatic CSS and Frames. Peace.